It's become such a political thing, nationalism. Yes. And I wonder why does it need to be political? Mm. The, you know, the uh, red light area of Sonagachi, which is uh, Asia's largest red light uh, district. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I took him along, you know, I went on a sting operation. Mm. <laughs> Aspirations of a woman are not always matching to the role that she is mm. at. Mm. So I wish uh, and I hope and uh, I'm actually optimistic that mm. uh, India would one day move to that point where mm. uh, women would be doing and being rather, mm. you know, who they really want to be. Welcome to my show, Conversations in the Raw. Today we have a very special guest, Minya Chatterjee. Welcome, Minya, Hi, to the you. show. Uh, Minya is uh, an economist, an intellectual thinker, writer, and uh, she lives in Goa. She has lived in many parts of the world. We'll talk more about that. Um, as an economist, she she has worked with some global banks. Uh, she has worked with the World Economic Forum. Uh, she has worked with the Jindal Group um, as a sustainability officer and now she runs her own company called Sustain Labs Paris um, and recently she has come out with a book called um, Indian Instincts published by Penguin India. Cool. Um, so, let us talk about the book now. Yeah. Uh, amid all these movements going around in the world, right? Um, and you are shifting places. How did you get the idea to write a book like this and then work on it, get it published? I mean, yeah. it is really an accomplishment and uh, I must add here that you know, I had the opportunity to read the book and uh, it is brilliant. I love it because you have dealt with very serious themes, but you have narrated everything so lucidly that anybody, in a, even a common reader uh, can connect with it, can understand it. So, tell us about the journey of the book, how it happened. Thanks, Zafar. And um, you know, I just wanted to say that what you just said, that writing it very simply, talking about issues which are uh, crucial or sometimes are stuck in academic circles and bringing them out into, into, into writing it very simply. It's so interesting, Zafar, because the criticisms that I've got as well as the highest praises that I've got is always for the same, mm. this, this mm. point. And uh, I think because um, we are used to talking about democracy and nationalism yeah. in a certain way. Mm. Um, just like, for instance, you know, historians, um, you know, they they we are used to reading history in a certain format. But you do have now certain historians, like a very good friend of mine, Willem Dalrymple, for instance, yeah. Yeah. who's made history so interesting. Mm. And so that is just interesting for all of us to read about the history of different parts of the world. And um, I feel that in this genre of, uh, uh, you know, in this kind of content of uh, talking about uh, political economy, which is actually what this book is about, political economy of, of India, um, I hadn't come across something which um, just talks about these issues mm -hmm. in a way that uh, makes people relate to it. Yes. Um, you know, the economy is always something very distant. Mm -hmm. um, issues like nationalism, is always something which goes back to history, mm. you know. And uh, what I have always been a voracious reader, you know, I, I mentioned my, we've, we've been living in very far-flung parts of India, mm -hmm. and my window to the world was through books. Um, you know, my parents uh, encouraged me to read, My the, their gift to me on my first birthday was a set of 10 books. So, um, <laughs> yeah. So, but what I really missed was what I really wanted to know is what is all these things that I'm reading about. How does that impact me? My PhD was in, you know, in international relations, but how does that impact me as a person? Mm -hmm. And um, so it's 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 really that that's the reason why why I wrote this. Um, and a lot of my favorite writers, um, economist Amartya Sen, for instance, um, I love what they write, but I also feel like it's based on sample groups, it's based on surveys and studies. 
uh, mostly. I mean, if not entirely, but, mm-hmm. but mostly. And uh, what I feel like I'm, um, you know, I'm a practicing academic, right? So yes, I do have a PhD and I teach and everything, but then I'm also on the ground uh, with people, work, working for people. So there is all those experiences and whatever little observations that I've made mm-hmm. and the interactions with people I've met. Mm-hmm. It's the people that I've met that I wanted to put into this book. You know, it's, it's their story. So I think this is what led to the character of the book, which is uh, talking about, yes, issues, which the ideas uh, and arguments, which I feel, uh, you know, are r- usually in academic bubbles. Right. Uh, but at the same time, just bringing it out to people, uh, making it their story. Perfect. I mean, mm-hmm. That's why it's so relatable. Um, Indian instincts, right? I mean, yeah, uh, we all know this and you have mentioned this in, in your book as well, that the whole humanity comes from a single yeah. parent, right? Yeah. Uh, one couple started from Africa, spread throughout the world. And then we are now different nations, different countries, there are borders and there are problems because of that. You, know, you mentioned that as well. So does it mean that uh, different nat- nationalities, people of different countries have different instincts or is the human instincts one and the same? Yeah. What are your thoughts on that? Yeah. So the whole point in this book is that, um, you know, there is no... Um, there is no predefined instincts that we are, you know, that we are born with. So, um, we are conditioned by the environment that we mm. live in, mm. and and our own life history, mm. and that defines our spontaneous behavior towards situations, mm. and that essentially is what instincts is, right? What's our instinctual reaction? Right. So your spontaneous behavior is conditioned by what you have around you mm-hmm. and how you are reacting to mm-hmm. that. Mm-hmm. Um, so I think instincts is an ev- evolves in different parts of the world and yeah. it can be defined by the larger macro context that you're living in mm-hmm. as well as your immediate you know, surroundings and your mm-hmm. immediate personal experiences. Mm-hmm. And I've called it Indian Instincts, and you know, you might think looking at the cover that, um, or the top, the, the title, that oh, it'll be talking about you know stereotypes in India, or mm-hmm. how Indians are, or how you know um, um, the in, very Indian traits, let's say. Mm-hmm. But actually, when you read through the whole book, uh, mm-hmm. I've explained it in the introduction as well. Mm-hmm. My whole point is that actually there is no stereotypes. We mm-hmm. we're all products of the environment around us. And yes. in the context of India, it is that the way India has evolved and mm. how, where we have come so far, mm. what does that, how is that changing mm. each one of mm. us? Mm. Okay. okay. And would you like to tell us something about the uh, you know, organization of chapters? I think that was also very interesting. <laughs> uh, uh, I think uh, it would be nice if we can tell something about uh, this to the readers. You know? So the part one is instincts, part two is anchors, and part three is trapped in our own making. Part four is chaos, and then you have conclusion. Interestingly, the conclusion is called freedom, so uh, probably that's what we are looking for. <laughs> so, would you like to tell a little bit about the organization of these uh, yeah. the content like yeah. this? The uh, the organization of the content was was amazing. You know, it was just came so freely. Before I had even mm. thought about the book, it just came mm. very easily to me. Because I think it, it was all there in my head at exactly what I wanted to put in. Yes. And uh, that chapter that you saw, Trapped in Our Own Making, is, mm. uh, is the hypothesis of the mm. entire book. That mm. uh, the institutions that we've created, mm. um, corporations, mm. um, religion, mm. govern, governments, mm. um, specifically these three that I've mm. focused on, these are institutions that we've created and... Um, you know, for years being involved in these three or, mm, mm. Um, institutions, I've worked in corporates, in politics as yeah. well, religion we have all around us, you know, the conflict that it causes and the hope that it gives. I feel, I, I, I really strongly felt that um, somewhere we're trapped within these institutions and mm. I wanted to write it out to see that to what extent our... Um, you know, is are we? Is it a Frankenstein kind of a situation? Mm. Um, and uh, so that's really the hypothesis. And and, and you know, when uh, uh, my editor Millie at Penguin mm. 
she she had been wanting to uh, wanting me to write a book for mm. for, for, for a long time mm. um, and uh, I was I was actually more interested in fiction mm. and there was a fiction manuscript that I actually wrote okay. <laughs> and for you know for years at that for six years I was writing that and I, and I didn't want to publish that I just I was, I was writing that for my own self and that I, my heart was in that fiction mm. book. Mm. Um, and I was not writing non-fiction and I was so involved with, you know, um, doing work and um, my not-for-profit and World Cry Forum and moving to India and stuff. But when I moved to India, I started writing op-eds, opinion mm. pieces and a column in, yes. in the Indian Express yes. and the Pioneer. So then it got me started onto non-fiction and I started enjoying it and there was so much that I wanted to write about India. So then when I spoke to Millie, who had already been three years that she had been having this conversation with me about writing a book and I you know wrote to her and she said let's meet for coffee tomorrow I messaged her and then we met and I told her this is what I want to write mm. and it was just the topics that you just said I actually just showed her that mm. and on the basis of that she said please write this book mm. um, so yeah so you know that was a story about the content yeah, yeah, yeah. no it's awesome and, uh, and in conclusion it's so powerful I would, I would love, I mean, all you readers and whoever are uh, watching this program to, to read this book, pick up this book and read it. Um, let's go more into the themes of the book now. Um, I love this, this very simple, not simplistic, but simple, powerful idea, the central theme of the book that the institutions that we created for our own good, for our own convenience have created inefficiencies for us, created problems for us, right? And now we are trapped in that. How do we get out of it? This is a very, very powerful theme. And uh, I mean, most people are thinking about these things, maybe not exactly in this way, but they realize it deep down in their heart that this is exactly the problem. How do we get out of it? Uh, we have become slaves to the system of, of our own yeah. creation. Um, so uh, let's talk in terms of India because the book is about Indian instincts. In the last 60 years, 70 years, ever since we became free, politically free, right? Mm -hmm. There are so many other kind of freedoms that we need to mm, achieve yet. Yeah. yeah. Uh, what are the good things that have happened in India? Yeah. So you know we've made tremendous progress, of course. Uh, you know, uh, but that's again that's something that that we all know, right? Mm -hmm. so, you know, we have uh, famines which have been, you know, stopped. There used, to, mm. there used to be a land of famines. We don't have that anymore. Mm. Life expectancy has really increase it's more mm. than doubled actually it used to be 32 when you know when we were when we got independence mm. and now with 66 the average life expectancy mm. Mm. literacy rates have increased as well mm. um it used to be around 17 mm. uh, at independence mm. in the last census mm. uh, we're mm. up to the mid six, six, 74 percent now mm. but of course for women it's, uh, it's still lagging yeah. 64 yeah um, and so on and so forth. I think in terms of development, yes, we do have the we, we, we numbers look, look good. Mm -hmm. Our economy is doing well as well. Uh, we have a very vibrant democracy. Mm -hmm. um, I think one of the one of the interesting things about Indian democracy is that uh, we have a lot of regional parties which mm -hmm. come up, mm -hmm. come with its good and its bad. But that's very interesting, which means mm -hmm. that you know the grassroots as well. People have an opportunity to uh, participate in in politics. But I think at the same time, um, um, I um, I feel that the most marginalized communities in India, um, so they have benefited the least mm. from these wonderful things that have happened. Mm. So you know all the things that I talked about in terms of development. Uh, if you look at the numbers, you know, if you look at, or even if you like, go down to, to these regions, you'll mm. see that they don't even have basic drinking water. Mm. So, mm. 133 million people in India, they don't, um, families in India, they don't have basic drinking water in India. Mm. Mm. Um, you know, literacy rate, I mean, it's 4 out of 10. So, 6 mm. out of 10 mm. people don't know how to read. Mm. Um, and if you then go down to the different communities, mm. so, the Adivasis, actually the tribals of India, they are mm. the most um, mm. backward um, in terms of uh, disadvantaged mm. um, group in, uh, in, 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 in terms of their human development. 
um, and uh, their participation in politics is also very little and the reason for that is because they don't uh, make for a meaty vote bank mm. you know the mm. um, so so that's why the whole system of democracy it's not benefited mm. by the development of the tribals Right. Even on one hand, even though the, you know the, the India has become a very vibrant democracy and it's working well, at the same time the tribals it, and it, it's almost ten percent the the population of the tribals in India, and they're uh, they're they're lagging behind both in terms of development and as well as the participation in democracy and it's both linked. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. Similarly, I think you know the religious minorities as well. Um, Muslims um, and Christians, uh, right. they both make for large populations in, in India. And even though there has been progress in terms of, let's say, literacy rates of, of uh, the Muslim community in India has mm -hmm. improved, mm -hmm. but that I would say has been a lot of um, uh, their own initiative as well. Mm -hmm. You know, the Muslim community in India, uh, they have their own um, education system. Mm -hmm. um, um, we also have had, uh, you know, the Aligarh Muslim University and also other universities like Jawaharlal Nehru University, mm. which has had, which have had vice chancellors who are Muslim. So you, know, you have role models within the community. The Christians, of course, we know have been, uh, they have their own mission, missionary schools. Um, so that's the point I wanted to make that you know, despite the progress, I feel like um, um, the good thing is that. There's been immense progress, but with that we just got to take that with a pinch of salt. That is, that the disadvantaged groups have not, uh, you know, benefited that much. Okay, one of the um, insights in your book is, uh, which I really love, is uh, your work and observations about the Adivasi's community. That mm -hmm. something that you just mentioned, right? Yeah. Uh, the Naxalite problem that India has been facing, you know, because the government wants to uh, give. Uh, uh, them facilities like education system, mm -hmm. roads, etc., etc., training, right? And uh, the corporates are also trying to do that uh, together with mm -hmm. the government. But there is a resistance on the part of the Adivasis mm -hmm. in accepting these reforms or modern uh, uh, things mm -hmm. in their lives. Mm -hmm. And you say that who are we to impose modernity on them, right? And that has sort of led to a lot of conflict situation in 30% uh, of India probably. So, um, uh, how did you reach this conclusion and uh, do you think this is still going on and what is the way out? Yeah, so um, uh, through my not-for-profit that I was you know, working uh, mm -hmm. you know, with my team on and um, as well as my most recent role at the Jindal Group. Mm -hmm. So, um, the Adivasi community, I have been working very closely with them. Mm -hmm. uh, the Jindal group, you know, most of our factories were yes. in Orissa and Chhattisgarh. Yes. Um, and uh, in regions where the population was, you know, had a strong tribal uh, community living mm -hmm. there. Mm -hmm. um, and what I what I observed and what I was involved with as as, 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 as well was that um, you know the government corporations and the missionaries as well, Christian missionaries as well. So they, they're trying very hard to develop the tribal community. So mm. they're mm. Uh, providing education, they're giving them jobs, teaching them skills, mm. uh, making roads, uh, infrastructure, helping them with you know, things like making tube wells and um, various forms of livelihood. Mm. Um, and uh, question which and in my role through the not for profit and through the gender group was that to speak with them to all the time and interact with them to be very close to them to know and for me it was a, it was a moral dilemma because mm. um, I felt like um, modernity is about um, you know individual modernity it is about having the choice mm. right, of having the choice to do what you what what you think is right yeah. and to giving others the choice of doing what they wish to mm. and uh, what we are doing is that actually pushing it down their throat that you know this is what is good for you mm. you know telling the tribal communities <coughs> in India that you need to be educated in this way, way. yeah this is the schooling that you need to be schooled in mm. um, and uh, you know we telling them that the way that you are living is improper 
mm. and being tell you what's mm. good for you mm. and uh, for me that has always been very problematic you know mm. about mm. telling others what mm. what's good for them i mean mm. i think we need to bring people up to the to a level where they know what's good for them and what's not good for them mm. Mm. and the tribal communities i mean they have their own ways zafar I mean, when mm. you actually working with them so closely and you know them well they have their own ways of doing things of learning of you know living their lives and livelihood they are fine mm. you know mm. um i think the part where they need help is that they living in a system which is a bit divorced from the system of the rest of the country so which means that um it's easy to manipulate them so in that sense yes they need to be educated to make certain choices mm. which are relevant to the rest of mm. the country mm. for example choosing a government mm. you know so again so that's something which they because otherwise it's very easy to manipulate them into choosing mm. a government mm. which yeah. give them short term you know mm. benefits so that mm. that's where they they need to be talked about talked to and mm. what's what are the choices they have and what they sh- what what they think you know mm. what they should do mm-hmm. but other than that i mean who really are we to you know say that um, you know you need to learn your livelihood and therefore you need to learn how to make ropes with the jute that you have that mm-hmm. you use mm-hmm. so you know um the only context in which then they they need to be educated mm. is where you know there is is to 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 help them understand the choices that they have mm. politically in mm. using their government mm. because their world is quite different you know from the rest and mm-hmm. there if we don't do that then it's easy to manipulate them with mm. short term benefits mm. Mm. and that can be very dangerous not just for the community and but for the country itself because mm. the travels do make for a large population mm. but other than that and to, you know i think that we we have to it's it's a, it's a it's a fine line you know between preserving their authentic culture and their ways mm. um and at the same time bringing them up to speed with the give it the then getting the life that they want mm. Mm. um Yeah, yeah. It's, yeah. it's their own trajectory that they have to rise. They have to fo- in. yeah, rise and follow. Rise in. But yeah, what's yeah. happening now is that it's like we you know, we're tutoring them that you know, this yeah. is this is the This is the way you have to follow. Path, yeah, you have to life. follow this path. Yeah. 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 And uh related to this is the uh, question about the uh, overall education system in India. Yeah. Because uh they talk about giving people choices, giving people a space, right? understanding the other person's point of view and respecting it and accommodating it right that is something probably lacking in our education system and i think you have mentioned this in your book yeah. can you talk a little bit more about that uh, from the point of view of the education system of india yeah sure um yeah uh, so if you look at most of the conflicts that we have mm. in india um, or even across the world mm. um religious conflict ethnic conflict yeah um or even in our personal lives as well in the family unit or in society in the communities that we live in often the the crux of it is that we're not able to see the other person's point of view mm. and uh, you know going back to the hypothesis of the school book that um, the institutions that we've made of which one of them is the judiciary the, the, the legal system essentially those were laws that were made so that people respect each other people don't kill each other right mm, so it's mm. at the base of of it it is to protect each mm. other's lives yeah. and uh, how effective has that been i mean we've not caught into this whole legal system and we're fighting cases in the court for all you know conflicts that we have um you know in the personal lives or um at larger issues um but despite any of these laws you know you know i feel like despite in number of laws that might be made um which would to to ensure that uh, we don't harm each other um uh, unless we are taught Mm. unless we are educated the the the, the, the word education unless that means mm. that to be raised 
to be able to respect each other's views or understand that mm. different people have different points of view mm. and they all might be equally right and equally mm. wrong in yeah. different ways yeah no number of laws the legal system the government will be able to protect individuals from mm. harming each other mm. Mm. you know so we talked about you know the the troubles in india uh or if you take up any you know uh conflicts that we have in 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 india ethnic conflicts and stuff so we you set up punishments and you know they can you can set up different kind of laws but what at what really needs to be done is that education itself should mean that not a degree only and mm. not simply just wipe away the whole system mm. but uh, not just a degree only but the crux of it has mm. to be that how do you raise a young human being mm. into mm. Uh, an adolescent to, you know and an, an adult who understands that mm. anybody's point of view that he's exchanging with has meaning that you know to be able to put yourself in another person's shoes mm. is that we need to put ourselves in a person in belonging to a tribe and see that what's that person's point of view on the subject mm. not just say that you know mm. oh you know you don't know anything you know mm. you're, you're part of a community which doesn't know what mm. 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 so i think that's where we need to come to and again it's not just in india zafar mm. um you know the other day we were talking about it as, as well um um you know that uh, it's really that it's something that saddens me because the challenge is so hard it's it's really the education system across the world which needs to move mm. towards uh, mm. to, towards that criteria absolutely and related with this is the idea that in the context of india right uh, we started with one idea of india now there is another parallel idea of india and between these two uh, different points of views mm, Uh, the citizens are trapped mm -hmm. and there are some people who are taking advantage of this right uh, in terms of the politics we hear about lynchings we hear about murders uh, imposing um, you know one particular kind of thought on the whole population and making victims out of citizens right um, in a way i think of course this is uh, a result of the kind of education system we have had but uh, going forward how do you see any kind of Uh, resolution in this debate of nationalism in india you know when you think it's going and uh, the symptoms that we see are so disappointing this happening yeah because there's so much violence because of it yeah yeah i think that we've taken uh, nationalism way too literally <laughs> you know because um, it's become such a political thing nationalism yes and i wonder why does it need to be political mm. so if if you look at you know any um if you look at any anything that you read you know mm. nationalism mm. or um the ideologies around it or uh, historians writing about it as well mm -hmm. it always goes back to in, in the context of india it goes back to the birth of india it goes back to the birth of the indian nation mm. and the nationalist struggle mm -hmm. um and uh, you know and uh, if there are two I think broad schools of thought on nationalism they're emerging out of that um one is more of a notion where um you know any individual who thinks who feels like he's an indian and mm. in india is an indian there's an eruvian idea yeah, right it's more of an eruvian yeah. yeah idea mm. and uh, you know the other point of view another school of thought rather which is emerged is uh, is actually quite old which is basically saying that uh, it's more of an ethnic territorial kind of a yes. concept of india where yes. uh, the original mm. territory mm. of india is the india and all the people who were living in that territory within that territory are the true indians mm. uh, for whom india is the matrubhumi mm. in the motherland Mm. and anybody who have has come from beyond those borders mm. within india mm. is uh, you know for them it's the fatherland and it's not mm. really they're not truly you know mm. uh, indian mm. so that's the more um, you know ethnic territorial kind of definition mm. of uh, the indian you know for being, for being an indian 
um so nationalism and a person's allegiance to a country is now being defined mm. by, by these two mm. prisms mm. uh be it you know, how how much um you know whatever your background is are you you know are you, how how indian are you mm. or that whether you're part of that old mm. territory mm. of india or not mm. where and uh, i do feel that both these schools of thought at the end of the day are driven by political parties mm. right mm. uh today mm. and as well as you know when it originated as well mm. um but at the end of the day nationalism is essentially if you think about it it is about what you feel what i feel about mm. country mm. Mm. you know what is my feeling towards my country am mm. i you know am i uh, proud of my country am i uh, you know an activist for improving my country mm. am i um do I feel a bit distant from my country what is the emotion hmm. between me and my country right and it is actually a very personal thing nationalism yes and i have no idea why has it become such a political issue that exactly. can that you know, government have to tell me hmm. what is it that i have to do hmm. to be nationalist nationalist and and emphasizing that it is not just this government i think with this present government in india it has just come more in the media mm. for a long while the academic debate around nationalism or the common you know media mm. debate on nationalism mm. is all very political yeah so but at the end of the day we have to actually come to a point where how is it that you and i feel towards my towards uh, you know the country that we live in that exactly. is what nationalism is yeah. and i think you talked about like the solution to mm. um, reducing the um, the the uh, you know the uh, uh, the bloodiness of this whole mm. 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 you know strife around nationalism people have been killed in the name of nationalism i think the solution to that is when you realize that each individual has a separate emotional connect to the to the country mm. depending on you know the background that the person comes from the background and the sense the environment immediate in environment mm. uh, the personal experiences and uh, we talked about education which is essentially then looking at okay that person's point of view and emotion mm. towards the country is so and so because that is the environment he or she has been mm. brought up with mm. and for me it is i feel xyz towards india mm. or towards whatever country because this has been my um you know experiences in life and mm. therefore the way i feel about my country is different about how we feel about he feels about the right. country yeah. live and let live yeah. <laughs> easier said than done yes. at least seeing is a first step yes yes yeah yeah we we talk about vasudev kutumbakam the whole universe is uh, a brotherhood or a family right and let's start from india itself yeah. uh, it's, it's time to do that yeah. and um, one of the last topics i want to talk about uh, which is very important uh, uh, importantly raised in your book and very close to my heart also is uh, is the empowerment of women uh, we we talk a lot about empowerment of women um, and there are a lot of uh, um, non profits and uh, organization that are working in this area but still it seems that india has a long way to go before that happens you know uh, depressingly we hear news day after day about rapes and about uh, so many crimes that are being done uh, against women in india how do you look at the situation in india now in terms of women's empowerment and mm-hmm. you have been in the field you know do, doing work on that in that area so what do you think the situation is right now and uh, how can women be made to feel more safe and uh, given more opportunities you know to grow and flourish yeah you know i think i'll start by saying that there has been a lot of progress for mm-hmm. women in mm-hmm. india mm-hmm. um so uh, i i won't go into data the numbers and data because um is there in the book anyway yeah. in the book and yeah. then um you can find that yeah, yeah. Uh, but um you know in terms of um, in politics for instance you know, there's a lot of women in mm-hmm. politics mm-hmm. very prominent women as you know yeah. they're in politics if you look at large companies in india corporations banks mm-hmm. uh, sbi icici some of the biggest banks are actually headed by mm-hmm. have been headed by women and some of them are still um entrepreneurship as well the women entrepreneurs who've done very well 
well. So, and then, in, you know, in everyday life, um, I think uh, women are being more visible. You, you, mm. you step out, you see women on the go. Mm. And for me, the criteria is not about how many women are working on jobs. Mm. You know, mm. you, you just see women actively involved mm. in life. Whether mm. it is raising a family, whether it is going shopping, out mm. there. Mm. So, I think that these are all very good signs. Um, in the progress for me, and you know, uh, progress for me is about the degree of choice that an individual has. Mm. You know, and uh, um, there, I feel that there have been, there's been, there's been an improvement for women, but they have, there's a lot more to do as well. So, for example. Um, a woman who has had a baby, I've had a, a child, a new mother. Yeah. Um, how much of a choice do I have mm. to uh, continue with work if mm. I have a job, um, or to be a stay-at-home mom, mm. Mm. Uh, or to take a break and then get back to to work? Mm. Um, I think you know the the, the the how much freedom. Uh, does a woman have mm. uh, in terms of making an independent decision how to lead her life mm. is an aspect which we need to look more into. Mm. Mm. So, um, to give you an example, um, when um, you know, alongside my job at the World Economic Forum, I was running this tiny not for profit, and one of the things that I'd done was to um, you know, create a fellowship for a girl in the village that I was working in, mm, in mm, mm. Um, and the fellowship was at King's College. Mm. And uh, you know, I, I did my best from you know, my whatever I could that um, I, with the help of the local university principal, uh, selected the right girl who would want mm. this kind of an opportunity. I didn't want to like thrust it down someone's throat, mm. but. Got, you know, um, so that, that selection was made of a girl who would like to embark on an opportunity to study more. We sent her to South Africa to work in a not, not for profit, which is run by a friend of mine, which looks at which you know, that, that not for profit works with the community where the community itself improves itself. So just to give her a taste of what it means, what you know, to for, for her to probably get an education and come back and then mm. help her community develop more. Yeah. Um, got her into an English speaking course because at King's uh, they granted her the fellowship mm. but uh, they said that she needs to work on her English so we sent mm. her to Hyderabad for classes mm. you know got her English but at the end of the day you know when, and I was in Geneva and I was, I was to come back on every month to work on this and other things mm -hmm. and then you know after all this work when, when I came back after a few months uh, you know on my monthly trips um, so I heard, so she told me that um, she doesn't want to go mm. to King's College in London. Mm. Mm. And uh, I heard different reasons from different people. Um, you know, someone said that she, she belonged to a Devdasi community. So, Devdasi mm. communities, as you probably know, um, you know, it, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's a tradition rather that uh, the, the current um, avatar of the community is that a girl, as soon as she's born, she's given to the temple, and essentially, what happens is the men in the village, um, you know, they they can use her, um, and uh, so she, the, the the girl, would not know who her father mm, is, mm. and uh, the tradition is that every generation of that community has to be a devdasi. So some people in the village told me that you know community did not let her somebody says she has a boyfriend and did not let her somebody said her mother did not I did not press her to ask her that why do you not want to because again for me progress is choice yes. if she has made a choice that she does not want to go for whatever reason mm. that she wants that is her choice and if I'm forcing her I'm actually I'm actually you know doing more damage than mm. Mm. Um, but you see that Whatever that reason was, I wonder if it was her own individual reasoning that she didn't want to go, or, mm -hmm. or was it her community, or was it her, fam her mother, or mm -hmm. was it some other pressure, mm -hmm. uh, family or boyfriend, which you know mm -hmm. made her mm -hmm. take that mm -hmm. decision. Mm -hmm. So these are two examples of you know my own as a young mother mm -hmm. or somebody that I've known. 
Yeah. So I think that is something that we in India that we need to work more on of giving women hmm. the power of choice, hmm. leading the life that they want to. Of, you know, joining a company and not being put into a department where typically women. Are supposed to work, and that could be many things. You know, in India, teaching is a women's job. It's not always in all yeah, countries. Yeah. Nursing is a women's job, you know, or in a company, HR is a women's job. Mm. In different countries, it's different. Mm. Uh, but often that's the case. You know, the, your the aspirations of a woman are not always matching to the role that she is mm. at. Mm. So I wish, uh, and I hope, and uh, I'm actually optimistic that. Mm. Uh, India would one day move to that point where mm, mm. Uh, women would be doing and being rather, mm. you know, who they really want to be. Yeah, wish that as well. Uh, one related area uh, of what you just said is what is holding us back as mm -hmm. a country as well is casteism, right? Casteism is, is a big issue there. And I was uh, fascinated to read about your account of, uh, you know, uh, going into Sonagachi, the uh, red light uh, district in, in Kolkata and probably even there you found traces of casteism. Yes. And, and so tell us about that experience and yes. what you found, found out. So, uh, so me and uh, Chirag, you know, so uh, I'm married to him now and at that time uh, he was my boyfriend. So I was curious to, um, you know, I was writing the book and then you know, I was curious to know about uh, the, you know, the uh, red light area of Sonagachi, which is uh, Asia's largest red light uh, district. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I took him along, you know, I went on a sting operation. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so I took him along because, um, essentially because um, I couldn't pose as a customer and you know, mm -hmm. I, I wanted to speak to the women mm -hmm. and I wanted to uh, see what happens, uh, you know, in this yeah. largest red light district. And why I wanted to go in and find out is because India, you know, the topic of sex is so taboo in India. You can't talk about sex in the family, which is your closest social unit. Mm -hmm. You can't talk about sex in the school, which should be important education around it. Mm -hmm. And yet our population is booming, you know. And we have the largest, uh, you know, uh, red light area in India. So obviously mm -hmm. there is this big... Demand. Yeah, yeah. And my whole chapter, there's a whole chapter on procreation. Yeah. And it is on this um, irony and this, you know, it's it's the two different ends of a spectrum hmm. and making sense of that and why is that so. So one of the field work that I wanted to do was to go into Sunagachi, the Asia's largest sex um, you know, uh, um, industry, in, in, uh, which is in India. Um, so I took Chirag along. And uh, it was truly fascinating, uh, Zafar, because you know, what we saw is that uh, there are um, different buildings which b belong to girls who come from specific regions. Mm. So there would be one building which would be from it would be Marwari mm, girls. Yeah. It would be another, you know, building which would be the Agra Valleys who are supposed to be like the most the fairest of them all. Yeah, yeah, you, know, yeah you talk about that. Exactly, and we don't you know. So and um, so the, the, like, so, the, so those are supposed to be like you know the the the, the uh, courtesans of the Mughals and such. Mm, stuff. Mm. Um, and we were very uh, very curious to know to know to see what it's what, what they were actually uh, what's the reality. Mm. So yeah, so my. Um, uh, mission when I went in was to speak to the girls and to, um, to, to you know to know what their experiences were in terms of because when they would have customers who would be either men who are bachelors and you know who are living in a country where mm. sex is not talked about but mm. still they are coming into a red light area or mm. they would be men who are married and again living in a country with a very low divorce rate mm. so what is their you know, who are their customers what mm. are they how are they treated how are these girls treated mm. by men who come from an education system and education i mean education by in schooling and society and family where sex is not talked about mm. so how are they treated by such yeah. men mm. and also their own family life and personal life because a lot of these women have 
kids mm. a lot of these kids are actually living in sonagachi as well mm. Mm. so but um as a result of my investigation and my curiosity and you know to reach out to these girls and to know more about them what i found is that it's amazing with the car that you know they have they actually live in different communities and the reason for that is that uh, it's too full one is that it's a chain migration mm. so you know a girl from a certain city would come mm. and then would tell another girl from that city that you know oh i know how you know how to make ourselves comfortable mm. and then there is i can find you a room and i can find you you know mm-hmm. and then they'll get another girl and then they'll all be living in that same mm-hmm. building mm-hmm. but now what's happened is that that as, as clients as well they would know that uh, that you know there is a girl from a, if you, they want a certain type Mm. Girls, they can find it in that building. Mm. So now it's like supply and demand, which has mm. created this whole fascinating, fascinating, fascinating stratification within uh, the Sanagachi area. Uh, sad though. Um, moving to the last part, right? Uh, the last chapter is about freedoms, and uh, you talk about various net frameworks of freedom. Right? It's not just political freedom, right? Mm-hmm. different kinds of freedom that we need to have and achieve uh, that really make our lives meaningful and let us realize the full potential of our personalities. So in, in conclusion, you know, uh, how do you see uh, the future of India? Should, should we be very concerned? Should we be very depressed by what's going on right now? <laughs> Not There at all. There is a lot of hope. <laughs> no, no, I, I think, um, you know, there's, there's uh, wonderful things happening in India. There is no reason to be depressed. um uh, you know uh, things are things are progressing um um the reason for the, the book is for us to have an individual reflection mm-hmm. of where we are uh in the context of india and how india is changing our personal life it's really to hold a mirror to our own selves quite literally and uh, but uh, that mirror will of course show different will show the true image which would be different shades right so the goods and there are bads and in terms of freedom the reason why it's really the last it's the conclusion of the whole book mm-hmm. because um, the the whole birth of india uh, for many people it is with the independence of india from the british that's mm-hmm. when you know india uh, came about Uh, for many people again i say because mm-hmm. of course we talked about this that you know there are two di- other ways of looking at that as well mm-hmm. and many others as well but two prominent ways mm-hmm. um and that birth of india was the political freedom mm-hmm. of india mm-hmm. and thus we often tend to look at freedom only from a political point of view that mm-hmm. freedom means political freedom mm-hmm. uh however we think for the ongoing progress in india mm. to continue on its uh, uh, trajectory of progress we need to widen the definition of freedom quite a bit quite a bit really uh, from just political freedom that's not it we need to look at uh, re- relieving a person let's say who is hungry because for them for that person the, his starvation is he slave to his starvation and for him someone who's hungry freedom is to get food you know again we talked about women and you know who let's say uh, who's had a baby uh, I'm, like for instance me um freedom for a young mother is to be able to make the choice of either going to work or staying at home mm-hmm. you know so having that different types of freedom is what we need to look at that our is is the girl in um, sonagachi is it her choice to be in sonagachi or does she not have the freedom to lead the life of her own the girl that i talked about who i tried to get into king's college you know does she have the freedom to pursue an education that she wants to or is she bound by community the tribals you know in chatisgarh are they free to live the life that they want or do they have to be on the path of modernity defined by us so i think that is the broad, more broader 
uh, definition of freedoms mm. uh, that we need to look at mm. granting to people which would lead to further progress uh, you know of, of india wonderful it was a fascinating discussion with you thank you very much for coming on the show thank you zafar for thank hosting you. thank you